Hello, Spy fans, and welcome to our patch notes breakdown of the item changes coming up in Season 2. Uh, once again, you may recognize this cast of characters. My name is Hi Res Bart. I will be your host. And joining me today are the one and only Scott Zier, creative director for Smite, and Rory, a.k.a. Dry Bear, who you may know from the community, who is uh, our newest member of the design team and obviously uh, a big part of our community. So welcome, guys. And uh, today we're going to be talking about, as I mentioned, the items for Season 2 and, and what things we have to look forward to, what was changed, why it was changed, and what impact we expected to have on the game. That's kind of the holistic view of this thing. So we'll start apropos with the starter items. A um, couple of new ones coming in here, a couple of adjustments. Watcher's Gift, some adjustments. Death Toll, a little bit of adjustment. And then an uh, entire new starting item that's really, I think, coming to the forefront of uh, opening up diversity in builds, especially in the early stages, the Blue Stone. But... Let's start with Watchers. Let's talk about what changes were made and kind of why they were made for what seems to be a very popular item in the Guardian role. Yeah, so Watchers' gift got changed slightly. It kind of fills the same role as it did before, but obviously with more diversity in starter items, that changes how you go for Watchers. But now provides mana and HP when a minion dies near you. And this means that when you don't get the last hit on the minion, you'll gain that regeneration, you keep yourself sustained in lane, and you'll get gold for it as well. So this is, you know, as the name suggests, it's the Watcher item. You're watching minions die. You're part of the fight, but you're not actually taking any last hits from your support or from your hunter or from your jungler, whatever the case may be. It allows you to kind of be around in mid and long lane and really kind of keep your regeneration going. Mm. One of the nice things about this version, too, is that it's a little more consistent because it doesn't require your uh, teammate to actually get the last hit. Right. Um, you actually get the reward even if your minions get the last hit. So, you know, if you're not laning with, you know, Barracuda or someone that's incredibly uh, accurate, then... Uh, you know, you uh, basically still get that benefit. Still get the benefit, yeah. And, and so, uh, and also, it no longer provides gold per five. Um, so, a little bit less income coming in, but looking at the kind of whole system, you won't, in theory, need to buy as many potions to sustain. Um, my expectation is when you see Watcher's Gift that you'll see, instead of maybe the four potions start, maybe two or three, cut some of that gold and look to build, build into your boots next. Um, let's talk about Death's Toll. Um, pretty s small adjustment to this item, mm -hmm. mostly the attack speed being removed to prevent it from being such a potent, kind of mid-game item. Uh, as a starter item, it was really, I think, I personally think overperforming through about minute 10, where you saw that attack speed really being a, a big part of the build as the Hunters were building Devourer's Gloves, which did not provide the attack speed. So um, why was that the change that was made to this item? A and is my assumption right that that was attack speed was overperforming? Well, a couple of changes were made to it. Number one, the attack speed going away, which, you know, did allow some room for the build, but also this kind of led for space for the new sorry, right, I'm the bluestone pendant, mm. uh, and one of them more for mana, one of them more for HP. So along with the attack speed going away, we also lowered the amount of mana and increased the amount of HP you get for hit. So Death Toll is the more, you know, if you have a long AoE attack chain, Thanatos, Osiris, or you're someone who attacks a lot, or you don't really need as much mana, you'd like to have the sustain of the HP, be able to build that up uh, for yourself, and kind of stay healthy as long as you can man manage your mana pool and that way it allows you to be more aggressive as well because you're generally a lot more HP than someone with say bluestone pennant would. Right so like that that item I mean in in the kind of design perspective are we expecting this item to be maybe a bit more favored for melees as they're gonna have to take the damage get into the wave and they'll have the extra sustain versus bluestone perhaps being a little more attractive to the hunters that are using their abilities or their in-hands are cleared away from further away. Is that, is that accurate, or do you think that there's room for these items to mix and match, if you will? I would say it's more towards what your goal is. I mean, Bluestone Pendant, and we'll get to that in a second, but you know, th that kind of item is more ability-based, right? And so it allows even mm -hmm. Warrior Guardians to play, because uh, they don't have that mana pool consideration. And some melees that want to be more aggressive, they may want the mana as well. So it really depends on how your kit is built, what you plan to do, and sometimes it allows you to go in on-hit items as well. Let's say you're going for a Chins build on someone like Osiris. Mm. You may want the HP and a lot right. more, especially since you have the AoE, right? So it really changes based on how the character is designed. It's more like what your goals are for the start of the game. And, and that gives us, uh, leads us right into the Bluestone Pendant, as you mentioned, more of a mana regeneration item and uh, perhaps more of the lane control style versus Death Toll, which is a little bit more passive, farm up, get your, get your big items. Uh, the Bluestone allowing you to, to zone perhaps a bit more with your abilities. Um, so this item fills a pretty obvious gap, right? Uh, the blue buff was removed from the map, as we mentioned during the map segment, so there is this kind of mana uh, disparity for the hunters right now. So Bluestone, Bluestone Pendant uh, does have a little bit of a unique mechanic in that it returns yeah. missing mana, um, so it kind of encourages you to use your spells, but um, in, in kind of your play and, and how this thing is starting to play out through PTS, what are your, uh, I guess, kind of reactions to the Bluestone Pendant? And is it functioning as you expected it to? The Bluestone Pendant definitely is. Yeah, it's doing really well. And I think one of the things I like about it is it seems to be opening up uh, a lot of additional gods to plan roles that potentially they weren't able to before. Um, just because it's able to keep it as you burn through your mana, 
um, you to have enough to keep firing that next ability. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, it's um, it, it's almost like having a clear cat. You know, it feels similar to like a chalk, right? Where there's always enough for one more spell. <laughs> that's that's kinda, right. That's been my experience with the item, at least. Um, well, let's go ahead and transition out of the starter items into kind of the next uh, very core item for all builds, which is boots. Boots had some significant changes in this patch. Um, kind of off the top, Midas boots removed. Uh, so that that is. Pretty indicative, I think, again, you pair that with Watcher's Gift with the Gold for Five item being removed there, uh, or, or the aspect of that item. Midas boots removed as well. Why is Gold for Five something that's being transitioned out in Season 2? And what kind of things are being done to, I guess, accommodate the fact that you don't have this free income anymore, especially in the Guardian role? So for the supports, we want to really make the items a lot more accessible without this required track of getting mm -hmm. GP5. It seemed like the issue before was Watchers into Midas into something else. So Bringing the cost down some of the tanky items and removing the minus requirement allows a lot more diversity. Yeah, I think overall when we look back at season one, one of the problems we had with boots is that we just didn't have a lot of diversity. We pretty much either got pin boots or you got minus boots. Right. And so we wanted to bring some options in there that were a little bit more enjoyable. And then we also wanted to bring down the overall cost of boots. Um, since it's something that you know, you're know you almost going to get on every character, mm. uh, we wanted to make it a little, uh, a little less expensive so that you can get into the more interesting uh, parts of your build quicker. And as you mentioned, uh, penetration being removed as an option out That's of right. boots, um, right. kind of it forcing gods to itemize into penetration a little bit more, uh, in, in a little bit more of, of an invested way, right? Instead of just, you know, you have this kind of obligatory item in your boots that you can pick up this very important stat on, you know, you have to kind of itemize into it, where the boots now, on the physical side, are providing a lot more attack speed uh, and, and a lot of power uh, compared to where they were. On the magical side, again, it, it, it's significantly more power out of the boots, some cooldown reduction on, on your uh, Magi boots, but it's not really the, the same kind of panacea style of boot where you buy, you buy the penetration there. So, um, so new boots added in as well, the boots of Talaria, uh, big speed boots, and I think the reinforced mm -hmm. style boots as well being very popular here. Do you have any kind of predictions for how this plays out or any kind of assumptions for why these changes were made? And I, I actually like to highlight the, the uh, Ninja Tabi uh, as, a, as a big attack speed item and, and why we think that's competitive with the big power boots of the Warrior Tabi. We're actually seeing a good split of the boots on the PTS so far. It seemed the issue before was, you know, penetration was coming online a little bit too early, and it meant that defensive had less priority and less power right. in the beginning of the game because of it. Um, CDR also was a bit of an issue for some of the assassins and some of the warriors getting, you know, full CDR at about six to ten minutes, whereas before, you know, we have a powerful one like Jotun's, with you know pen and CDR on it, that's a great transition item for people that want to use abilities. So having the split of power versus CDR for magic and power versus attack speed for physical, you see a good split of you know hunters. A lot of hunters want the ninja tabi. They want that attack speed to scale right. into mid game. Whereas if you're an assassin, you really want that big boost of power to make your abilities stronger. So it's it's, a, it's an easier choice. Allows people, to, even the guardians, the warriors, and the mages to itemize better because you're not worried about the penetration early or the CDR for strong assassins early. But they have a great option to choose from. Yeah, I think that that's a, a good point to piggyback off of this idea that there's a lot more attack speed available earlier in the game, especially for the Hunters, uh, much less some of the base stat adjustments that were made during PTS to give them a little bit more oomph, especially through the mid-game in the attack speed category. Uh, that kind of transitions us right into these physical items that are coming out, uh, some of the new ones especially, and some of the big changes coming out were two primarily these in-hand focused items. Uh, you have the Chins Blade, the Blood Forge, these types of items being adjusted uh, nerfed or buffed in certain cases. Chin size obviously getting nerfed a little bit, but uh, a big buff is Ichbile, another in hand based item. So as the attack speed becomes more pop or really more available to the hunters and these new in hand items, in hand proccing items uh, become more in vogue, what's the, what's the desired kind of gameplay? What's, the, what's that strength curve looking like for hunters that we're expecting now given these itemization changes? Well, I think one of the things that we're doing, especially when you look at the hunters or in handers, is we wanted to make sure that there was a good distinction between kind of your your mid game ability casters and your late game attack damage carries. Okay. Um, and we really want to bring those out and and make them, uh, you know, make it so you can itemize more clearly for those roles. I think with the uh, the the base stat changes and the availability of early items and the fact that you know there's not a cap CDR assassin running around, warriors don't have as accessible protections, and guardians can be a lot more you know useful at the low levels because they have cheap items they can go for. It means that you know hunters are not as under fire is early on in the game. And they also, because they scale a lot more aggressively and there's more items they can choose through their build, it means that they can definitely come online a lot harder late game. We're seeing a lot more 
late game carrying from hunters once they finally reach that late game state that we did in season one. So it's more of, you know, you pick a hunter, you want to keep, keep them healthy throughout the early stages of the game, and they'll actually start to activate and, and make a big difference at the end of the game, whereas you still see a lot of influence from the assassins and warriors in the early game, as, as it often should be. Uh, so the itemization for hunters really helps them kind of grow into the mid and late game stages in a much more healthier way. So with these like super cost efficient attack speed items that we're seeing added to the game, uh, the Ifile, the Odysseus bow, um, you know, attack speed, as we mentioned also through the base stats becoming more and more relevant, Anti-attack speed items probably become more valuable. The Witchblade, obviously a very popular pickup already, but I want to highlight the Frostbound Hammer and the changes that were made to that item. Um, why was this an item that we thought was underperforming? Obviously, we added the Heavy Hammer and, and said, okay, this is really a great option, right? We have this early, you know, really hyper-aggressive on-hit slow item, but it transitions into like this HP semi-tank weird state item, and it was kind of, some of those stats were transferred over to this anti-attack speed base proc. Uh, can you talk a little bit about where you think Frostbound Hammer fits into builds in the current uh, changes? Sure. Frostbound Hammer is, you know, obviously it felt weird uh, because you had Heavy Hammer, you could get it accessible, I mean, uh, 13, 15 <coughs> million in the game, uh, but there wasn't really anything you could transition it to. I mean, really you're just increasing a little bit of physical power and a little bit of HP, but there wasn't that extra element. It was like, I really want to finish this Heavy Hammer and transcend. A lot of times we see people hold onto the Heavy Hammer until they were six slotted, sell the Heavy Hammer right. and get something else. And, with the attack speed slow, it's really kind of that Midgardian male, Witchblade feel, which is, like you were mentioning, the attack speed is very available now for a lot of characters, and slowing that down, especially against characters like Al Guang, Freya, magical users that have high attack speed, sure. it <laughs> allows you to slow them down and also slow their attack speed and give you a little HP and an edge against them, which also helps warriors transition out of the mid game. So we have, we have a couple of items remaining on the list here to go through. Um, one that we definitely want to highlight here is that Shield of Regrowth. Um, I, you know, and, and I'm not going to set this one up. I'm just going to let you guys go ahead and kind of break down what this item does, why the changes were made, and what we expect it to do. So, Shield of Regrowth, what's the, what was the kind of thought behind this item? Well, you know, we wanted to add some kind of fun, fun options for healers and for gods that heal themselves. And I think uh, that's something that we started looking at and we're going to continue to look at as the season goes on. Um, so really with Shield of Regrowth and, and with Lotus Crown, mm. we're looking to add secondary effects uh, when you're healing. So these are interesting items that you might itemize into. Um, yeah. You can probably talk a little bit more about the fun <laughs> of uh, getting the, uh, the, the boost speed. to speed. Yeah. yeah, I mean, one thing we noticed, right, is that you, you only have two active options mm -hmm. to choose from, two slots. And something like Bulwark of Hope we had in Season 1 where it has an active element to it that you don't have to control directly, it makes the game right. feel a lot more engaging. And so we want to introduce a lot more of those conditional items, Lotus Crown and, and Shield of Regoth, exactly. So, you know, you have a lot of physical characters, even Hunters, Neath, Cupid, that can heal themselves. Bakasura, Arachne, Chalk, Hercules, uh, even Nemesis. So we had a playtest the other day where Pon Pon, one of our quality engineers, uh, picked up the, uh, the shield regrowth on Nemesis. Oh, yeah. And when he reflected back <laughs> the damage and healed himself, he got a burst of speed. So it's very rewarding to be able to pop your heal, get a burst, uh, say for Arachne, for example, pop the one, get the heal, burst in front of someone and keep up, or Hercules pop the heal with the three, get in front of them and push them back, right? It really allows you to control the element of space by using that movement speed to your advantage. And these, mm. these are fun items too, because they, they have the, sort of the feeling of an active item, even though they're, they're not. And I think that adds a lot of enjoyment to the game when you're playing. Yeah, and kind of uh, piggybacking on, on that kind of uh, steroidal speed-based items, we have the Crusher as well, um, right. which is yeah. uh, it's similar in some respects in that it grants you some power, and basically, when you're hitting structures or objectives, it starts stacking additional speed for you. Right. Um, and this has a pretty obvious spot in, in, in terms of what it's supposed to do and what it's supposed to add to the game. It's supposed to open up even more this idea of the ability to split push or spread the map with a single character. Um, not so great of a sieging item, right? You wouldn't use this in a, in a 4v4 trying to hold a tower. But when you have a 1v1 or that kind of 1v just a tower, this item really seems to excel. Um, it is a little bit like ratty, though. I mean, you know, you kind of... You spread the map, you get a bunch of movement speed, and you run away. We already see this happening with Apollo. Was this looking at kind of trying to, I is it more in tune to say that we're looking to provide the option for hunters to do that style of play, to spread the map to try to solo towers? Or is it more of trying to incentivize the idea of, of trades? They're taking your tier one on the right, you take your tier one on the left because you have the crusher. Talk a little bit about where you think this item fits into a build. Is it a fourth slot or a fifth slot item? And how exactly do you think it's going to play out? The Crusher has been picked up actually quite a lot on the PTS. Surprisingly enough, people are really enjoying it. What this item really allows you to do is, in that situation, which I'm sure many players have experienced before, uh, you know, your team is, is losing a little bit in the early game, uh, missing some of the objectives, and you're in your lane un, un, you know, unmolested. You're not getting any aggression. No one's coming to gank. Now, you can pick this item up and start clearing towers out. Because a lot of times, if you fell really far behind, 
you never really had that opportunity to go and push a tower down, get some gold for your team, and start coming back into the game. Right. And so, you know, soul laners, hunters, assassins, they can all pick this item up, give a little bit of damage and penetration. It's not going to help them in a team fight. You're not really getting much. Maybe a flat bit of penetration helps, but you'd rather have a DPS item to really scale up your damage. But this item allows you to kind of bridge that gap of, you know, we're falling behind, or maybe we're a little bit ahead. We want to keep that lead going. I can push these towers down, and maybe I can get something out of it. Yeah, and it's also, you know, there's certain, there's certain gods that we've identified as being strong pushers, and that, that being kind of the role that they bring to the team. And there wasn't really a way for them to itemize into that except for more damage, and so we wanted to give options that could allow them to shift more into that direction. Right, yeah, I mean, in, in the current state of the game, penetration is really your only option for really amplifying your damage versus structures. So this, this gives you a little bit of a, maybe a better route to get there. Uh, to build that penetration and start doing the damage to the towers. But I do want to go back to something you said earlier, talking about the Shield of Regrowth and talking about how it's a similar item in many respects to the Celestial Legion Helm and the Lotus Crown, um, which are two major item overhauls, basically four mages in the defensive category. So let's start with the, uh, the Celestial Legion Helm. Uh, this is a pretty interesting item. This is primarily a luxury late game item, it seems like, four mages. Um, it's an <coughs> anti-crit item. And it was in the game in the last season, but it's been really refined into something that's a bit easier to control. Can you walk us through how that item's functioning now and where you see it, uh, or really how potent you think this item will be in the fifth or sixth slot? Yeah, you know, last season, uh, you know, we saw overall that it kind of underperformed last season. And what was happening is when you got hit, if it was a crit, um, you became immune to later crits, but not the one that hit you. Right. Um, and really for the amount of damage that deferred, it was uh, just not potent enough to put onto build, especially as a luxury item. So the new version, basically, uh, you get a shield around you, very similar to Magi's Blessing. Um, and, uh, you know, when a crit comes, you basically just ignore that first crit. Um, and then you also still get the But that's just the bonus actually. damage, right? Like that's you right. You still just get the bonus for damage. The, the flat that's damage, correct. just not the additional 200% or the additional 100% of the damage. That's correct. And so really it's giving you that protection up front, so it's more reliable that you know that you're going to have it when you go into a fight. Um, and really that's just a, a, a fairly strong buff to the item. And then, and then going back to the Lotus Crown, which is built out of the same tree as the Celestial right. Legion, uh, this is uh, still kind of this mid-game, third or fourth slot uh, protection item for mages to itemize against physical damage, but it also provides a little bit of additional oomph in the way of healing. Driver, can you walk us through that? Quite a lot, actually. This will provide uh, very similar to the old Sovereignty Aura to protect all. Uh, so what this item does, it really, when you heal yourself or anyone else, you'll get this protect all for five seconds. And it has a pretty significant uptime. And we're actually seeing a lot of, you know, Aphrodites and Hells and Chungas and Sylphanases pick this up as their second or third item, actually, uh, to start the game. You can see that there's a huge difference when they, they have the Lotus Crown protection there or they don't. Mm -hmm. And it really allows them kind of like itemize more as a support mage. But we're also seeing mages who want to really further their defensive stats. People like John Quay, he can pop the exorcism, heal himself up, get that protection boost. So when someone jumps on him, he can keep himself alive. So this is a healing option that's not really the Rod of Asclepius, you're not increasing your healing, but it adds another active element to your healing effects that allows you to really influence your team. Yeah, that, that's an important kind of differentiation to make that while the Rod of Asclepius, it adds additional healing and, and that's something that's been uh, definitely a big change in Season 2 is that mages and warriors, well, all, all gods no longer scale directly off of power to heal. Uh, they're required to build these items that are more focused on, on amplifying healing. So uh, when you look at items that, that provide uh, proc effects based on heals, it, it starts to incentivize those gods in a different way versus just double dipping with their power items. So uh, the kind of the final mage item here that we're going to go over today is the Polynomicon. Um, some changes to this item, especially over time, we've seen it adjusted from 100% of your magical power to 75 to 50. Now back up to 60, but with some caveats. So uh, Driver, walk us through what this item is and how we're expecting it to kind of play into this next season. Yeah, sure. I mean, Polynomicon has been growing with Smite. So Smite has gone through several metas and different changes to gods and restructuring of different classes and archetypes. And so it's kind of been following along with that trend. Uh, what it is, is that after using an ability as a magical caster, you can use this as Guardians as well, your next auto attack, your next basic attack, will deal additional damage based on your magic power. Mm -hmm. Now, what we've changed this to and what it was before is it was 50% of your magic power and you will able to hit on that. Now, it, it, the, one of the issues with it is that you could just infinitely shoot for that duration, and it was a little difficult to position it properly. So what we've done is we've extended the duration that you have the buff active, so it's actually eight seconds after using a build. You have a long time to kind of sit on it and decide really when you want to use it. And the cooldown went down by a second, so three seconds left until you can pop it again. Uh, the Polynomicon will do 60% of your magic power now, so a little more damage, a uh, longer duration to use it, but the downside with that now is that the next auto attack you shoot, regardless of whether or not it hits, 
is going to be the polynomial effect. You can't right. you can't just auto attack as long as you as you want to. And the next hit is the one that yeah. provides the damage. So this is definitely a buff to the item, but also uh, an increase in kind of the the skill required. To sure. Probably skill floor going up a bit for this, That's but right. uh, it do, it does still have a lot of um, pretty pretty clear kind of synergy with with certain mage kits. Uh, looking at Scylla and Giannis as primary kind of proponents for this item being very powerful for them. Giannis obviously setting it up with the portals. Uh, Scylla with the Sikkim uh, is able to then very easily land that in hand and steroid their damage and add to that shotgun effect that those characters generally right. will have through the mid stages of the game. Uh, that does do it for our mages. We'll move over to another magic damage primary class and the guardians here and start talking about mm. the major defensive items. And, and the reason I say guardians is because one of the major changes in this patch uh, and in this new season is going to be sovereignty. Uh, this was an item that was providing basically every defensive stat you could want, a tremendous amount of health, a tremendous amount of physical protection, and a tremendous amount of magical protection via an aura. Um, so what really has happened here is that Sovereignty and the Heart Ward Amulet have basically had all of those stats kind of split between the two of them. So, uh, Driver, can you, can you kind of explain the difference between Sovereignty and the Heart Ward Amulet and kind of where you would expect to see the Guardians itemize into these items uh, respective of each other? So the old Sovereignty, like you mentioned, would give a Protect All Aura. It was permanent. Uh, so now that it's been split, so one of them, the Hardwood Amulet, provides the physical protection aura, Sovereignty provides the magic protection aura. So what this does, and the interesting aspect of it is, the protection it gives you is not the protection it gives you an aura. Mm -hmm. So if you're buying the physical version of Sovereignty, you're providing a magical protection aura, and vice versa. So you really have to decide, am I helping my team or am I helping myself? Now it also does provide HP 5 on Sovereignty and MP 5 in the aura for Hardwood. So you see a lot of Guardians picking up Hardwood early if they want the physical protection and the MP 5 for your team but also doesn't help you very much against minions or towers or right. assassins or warriors or even hunters. I mean, you don't have that physical protection. So it's really, it's the loss versus the gain on who you want to help. Is it yourself or someone else? And also the HP went down on both of them. So them being more accessible and the fact that Watchers and Midas went away with the price coming down on them as well, mm -hmm. it means that, you know, Guardians have a lot of choices early. Would you expect to see a Guardian build both? Sure. Or do you think they're just too expensive? I mean, is it... Is it the kind of thing that you think it, it fits in that, that first defensive item slot and then you itemize a little bit more into what the enemy is, is building and doing? Or do you think that there is a, a real place for saying that this is your second and third item will be these two combined? Yeah, I think, I think with the prices coming down on those items and them being less luxury and more accessible in the mid game, combined with the fact that boots is now also cheaper, mm -hmm. um, makes that an option you could do on builds. You certainly can. And something we're seeing a lot of is you'll get one and then with Lotus Crown being around, maybe that's your physical protection item or maybe you want something a little more aggressive. Uh, spirit robe, of course, we'll get that in a second. Got a, a big buff in protection. Well, let's so just talk about it now, right? The there. spirit robe. I mean, it's it's a it's a really really powerful potent yes. item now. Uh, this was an item that was starting to see some play at the end of last season as a kind of crowd control reducing you know bridge item for to replace magi's or to supplement your magi's uh, for certain characters that only need like Kali, right? Only really needs the chin size to get online in terms of effective DPS, so could build two luxury defensive items, and this was often like kind of the second one. Uh, this item has been adjusted to be much more of a upfront mitigation item, but with significantly less HP. But can you kind of talk about uh, the passive on it and exactly where this item in your mind is positioned? Well, I mean, you, you see that the protections went uh, a little more even, right? Before right. it was a small amount of uh, physical. 10 physical and like 50 magical. It was a, it was a little bit awkward magical. item. I think a lot of players yeah. are actually a little bit confused about why it had such a small amount of extra uh, physical protections. But you know, now it, now it kind of matches up a little bit better in that tree, especially yeah. when you compare it to hide. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, so you get 40 protections on both, and you get a little bit of CDR. So you get that little, I mean, it bridges your gap, right? You can go Chronos Pendant into Spirit Robe and get that max CDR right away. Sure, sure. And then when you get CC'd, when you have a CC effect applied to you, you actually reduce your, the damage you take by 15%. It's a flat 15% damage reduction. And so right when you get initiated on, it's really great for almost anyone in the game. And so you'll see a lot of warriors pick this up early. Uh, maybe even itemize this for Hunters or Mages as their last item in the, in, this, in the slot set. If you get initiated on, you get that little extra bit of damage reduction to stay alive, and it's just a nice middle of the road, you get a, a good split of, of everything kind of item. Yeah, I mean, you can, you can kind of start thinking about the, the really the effectiveness of this item uh, when you start thinking about 100 points of physical protection and 50% mitigation against physical damage. Right. This provides 40 plus 15% flat reduction if you CC. So right. you're talking about a, a, an effective protection value against physical and magical that's actually quite high, yeah. um, uh, assuming that you're getting CC'd and being a frontliner in the fight. So it's, it's a pretty clear where this item fits. Um, speaking of frontliners, let's go ahead and transition over to two uh, adjusted items in the defensive category that are very squarely sitting in the warrior realm. Um, well, the Witchblade, first off, we saw that item transition even into Assassins and Guardians in the last season. Um, pretty clear indication that it was overperforming, I think. 
So what adjustments were made to this item? Uh, just to kind of clarify quickly, the Witchblade is an item that provides an anti-attack speed aura, reduces physical power, providing movement speed and attack speed in Season 1. Uh, what is this item doing in Season 2, and where do you think it fits into build? Um, well, in Season 2, I mean, it's uh, pretty clearly we just, uh, the item, like you said, was overperforming, and we nerfed it, and basically it lost its movement speed. Um, it was just providing a little bit too much across the board for characters that picked it up. That's one of the reasons you saw it on a lot of assassins. Mm -hmm. um, and so really this is just uh, a nerf to an overperforming item. When you see boots providing 18%, and you lose 3% movement speed if you pick up Witchblade. And so we saw a lot of people picking this up for the movement speed alone, and it really wasn't what the item was designed for. It's sure. more of a physical protection item that allows you to kind of push that power curve in your favor by lowering their attack speed, lowering their power, and giving yourself some protection, a little of attack speed. So, you know, taking the movement speed off, it means that this is solely that. It is a counter to physicals that have attack speed. You can also affect magicals with it. And it's really that kind of swing item that helps you get back to the game when someone's really taking you down. Sure. But you don't buy it for movement speed. Yeah, it feels like more of, right. a, uh, of, a, of a utility item now. Right. Um, or, 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 or less of, I'm sorry. It's actually more of kind of like a dueling item now. Uh, you're buying it, as you mentioned, for a specific matchup that you want to take uh, versus before where the attack speed reduction was, is good basically against all DPS, right, because it affects minions as well. And then the movement speed was allowed to bridge as a really, really potent utility item in addition to that. So I'm kind of mm -hmm. focusing it a little more is what I'm seeing there. And, and well, uh, its best friend was also hit in this patch, the Smithy's Hammer, uh, almost always paired with this item, the Rune Forge and Smithies uh, were, were like the kissing cousins to the Witchblade. Um, what adjustments were made to the Runeforge and Smithies? So Runeforge stayed exactly the same. It's the same price as 2050. It gives you 350 HP and 55 physical protection. And the reason why it works so well with Witchblade is, you know, 45 protections on Witchblade, 55 on the Runeforge, you're getting 100 protection, and then 15% of that was being turned into physical power. So you get a flat 15 physical power boost from both of them. Uh, the issue with the item is that it was very accessible. With the Smithies mm -hmm. Hammer being quite cheap, you can buy it, get an active, get some potions, and go to the solo lane and be kind of immune to a physical damage early on. It really helped you against warriors. And so we had the same treatment that we did to Heavy Hammer originally, where it just that tier two was so accessible, we just bumped it up. It's now 1,300 gold. Uh, you can't buy an active with it. You right. can't really buy anything else. You can buy potions, but that's about it. It's still being bought, and it's still effective item. It's just not as accessible early. Yeah, I mean, I think that's, that's the crux of it, right? You can't buy an active with it. So it does open up the invade strategy if, if you do think that they're going to be going for this, this item. It, it will limit their early the enemy's early game ability to farm flash farm up to level two to get to the lane, um, which is a really pretty big deal, especially for warriors who generally will take a clear ability and then some kind of defensive ability as their second uh, option at level two, and then with that smithy's hammer were, generally speaking, very difficult to actually kill. Um, and, and kind of finally to wrap things up here in items, we do have some actives, some new actives coming into the game as well as some, some changes. Uh, so we'll start with, with two big ones, two probably the most popular items in the game, the Aegis Pendant as well as the Purification Beads. So the, the tier threes of these items have been adjusted. Uh, starting with the Aegis Pendant, uh, basically there is no more option to use this item while CC'd. So um, I can tell you why I think that was changed, but uh, as not being part of the design team, I'll let you guys do it. Why, <laughs> why did we remove the option to Aegis while crowd controlled? Um, Aegis, of course, I'm sorry, just quickly. Aegis makes you immune to all damage types, just to right. get that out there. So this is an item that uh, you activated and made you immune to damage for uh, three seconds. So uh, why can you no longer cast that while CC'd, or why is that not an option? Sure. Well, you know, there, there already is a very good option to use if you're trying to buy an active item to work against crowd control. So a little bit we saw that it was just uh, branching to areas that it wasn't really used for. And we wanted to make the split between the two ages be, be pretty clear. You know, you, you get one branch uh, if you want to be able to move while you're invulnerable. You get the other branch uh, if you, you know, you're not able to move. But basically after the effect wears off, you have a, a really heavy damage reduction. Mm -hmm. um, and so we want to make the choice really clear and really just remove what we consider to be a little bit of excess and bloat on the item. Also means that you know there were some characters that were very strongly countered by the CC, just you know Poseidons right. and Lokis, and you know, obviously there are you know other options if you are worried about the damage coming in from them. But it doesn't mean that you know regardless of your positioning or regardless of what you do, you have an easy out. You have to make that kind of decision. That's mm -hmm. really what our goal is for season two, which is providing more depth in the game and really more options to choose from. Mm -hmm. So it, looking at that, the purification beads, um, another kind of item that was very heavily purchased, uh, and and really. It, kind of similar to that Aegis Pendant like we were talking about that you could use during CC and, and that was maybe a little bit of bloat. We saw in the Purification Beads this item was being purchased more often than not for the, the uh, CDR reduction that it provided, minus five seconds from all your cooldowns. Um, and that what is what it looks like got primarily hit in this patch. So Purification Beads go from five seconds to three seconds off your cooldowns with a three second uptime. Uh, and the Purge, of course, the Purge right. of CC on activation. So the item may be positioned a little bit more uh, discreetly in, into one bucket as uh, it, it's an anti-CC item that has this 
additional benefit instead of maybe buying it just for that. Uh, I do want to transition over into some of the more, I guess, fight, quote unquote, oriented items here. We have the Achilles Spear, as well as the Shield of the Underworld. Right. Um, these are two pretty, on paper, sound like very, very potent items. Um, the Shield of the Underworld, will start there. This is a damage reflect item right. uh, that prevents you from being life stolen from and reflects damage. Uh, and, and this item actually got adjusted a couple times in the PTS to be uh, pre and post mitigated damage. So can you kind of expound on exactly what that means, what those words mean, and, and why that's important and what this item is expected to contribute? Shield of the Underworld, what it really is designed for is, you know, I'm under pressure, and this can be purchased by really anyone. Uh, it's a good boxing item if you're, you know, taking damage from someone else, or if you're just being collapsed upon as a guardian or warrior. So what it does is it will actually take the damage you would have taken before mitigations, the full amount of damage that they would have dealt to you, and reflects that amount back as magical, which means that you, are, as the attacker, would receive the same amount of damage you dealt and then mitigate that based on your magical protection. And what this allows you to do is, along with the anti-life steel, means you can't just burn through it. It means that you are kind of this target you may not want to target for five seconds. You don't really want to attack him right now. And you have to worry about your abilities. It also allows you, you know, with the loss of the CC Aegis, means that if the Kraken's coming, you can pop this and reflect a lot of damage back at it. And, and lots more, you know, gameplay that's counter to specific characters. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and you know, we, we've played around with Damage Reflect before. You know, we had this fight show, which didn't really perform well. It didn't work too well. And obviously, we have uh, Hypening Midline. So I think we wanted to introduce an item that, that was active and very strong and really specifically focused on that one task. Sure. Well, I mean, height of the enemy line, it's interesting you bring that up, right? Because as a damage reflect item, because it is forced to be passive, right? The, the actual damage reflect can't necessarily be that potent because That's it's right. always on. So you introduce this active item that is a very significant, very potent damage reflect, but obviously has a cooldown and has limited uptime. So uh, there's, a, there's an interesting interplay between those two items. And I'll be, I actually wonder if they stack and how, what that means. <laughs> but well, that will be for testing uh, down the line here. Uh, and, and finally, that kind of leaves us with the, the Achilles Spear out of the active items as the new ones being introduced and, and significant changes there. Uh, this item provides uh, a big attack speed boost, a big movement speed boost, a lot of life steal, And it's a really, really good item except for the fact that you take additional damage when you activate it. So it's, it's a risk, very risky risk reward based item. Uh, and it's CC is its best friend. So um, where do you see this item actually fitting in? I mean, it, is it is it going to be on colleagues that just want to burn a target extra fast? I mean, that seems to be a very obvious kind of pairing. But where else do you think this item can excel uh, outside of maybe just assassins? We're seeing a lot of hunters pick this up for a big DPS increase. Now, obviously, because they can sit further back, uh, you know, taking additional 30% damage, as we just got done talking about how much damage reduction is great, right. damage increase is, is yes. definitely very <laughs> negative for your character. So, and also, one thing we should mention is Shield of Underworld and, and Achilles Spear are both cheaper than all the other actives in the game. They're 600 gold rather than 900. So you see a lot more accessible early game items that allow you to really kind of decide, do I want to commit to this or do I not? Uh, with the movement speed and attack speed and life still increase, you're really just full on, I want to get this guy or I'm not going to make it kind of thing. And really it kind of plays that, that idea of, you know, the Al Guang play style. Yeah. People really enjoy the, I want to get this kill and I want to get it now, mm. but there's a downside to it. So you really have to decide, do I want to pop this or do I want to try and hold back? Yeah, I mean, do you, do you see it potentially fitting into the Hunter to replace Sprint? Uh, is, is that where you see it probably? And, and like, do you think that this item paired with the Crusher is going to be a, like a popular style of, of this kind of take towers very quickly with the Crusher plus this attack speed stim? Or do you expect this to be, as you mentioned, more of, of a kill-oriented, uh, god-based item? I, I tend to think peop people are going to pick it up more as that kill-oriented, god-based item, although you can certainly use it in both roles. Um, and I really think it's the, the opportunity risk versus reward that makes it kind of a really enjoyable active to use. Because um, it just adds an extra strategic layer about when to use it and when to pop it that I think, uh, I think players are going to really enjoy. It's very clear that, that yeah. someone has it active as well. There's this strong purple aura right. that just throws off the character. And so, you know, once people start to understand what the item does and really recognize that effect, it's also going to be a, a bit of a tip to the enemy team, right? You see that sure. purple, you're like, oh, get Kill that, that guy. guy. Yeah. Get yeah. him. And then you're going to see a lot of burst damage come out from that. And, uh, you know, like, like I mentioned, a lot of DPS increase for hunters late game. And, you know, it, it also really makes a skill element for hunters that they just realize that I'm under fire right now. I have a great position. And the, the, the team fight split right at the right moment. I can pop this, get a lot of DPS in that one target and get a kill. And it really is helping kind of the assassins and the hunters have that moment of, of, of glory that they really were missing at some certain points in season one. Right. And obviously the big trade-off here is that you don't, you still incur in-hand penalties with this item That's as opposed right. to Sprint That's 3, even though they both are very steroidal in terms of your mm -hmm. movement speed and allow you to do lots of damage in a short period of time. Sprint 3 still providing the, the lack of in-hand penalty, uh, which, which I think still makes it very competitive. 
right. to this item, if, if not preferred for many hunters. And the lack the, of, of slow immunity. Right, it, yeah. right, no slow That's immunity correct. as well. So you can be kited with this item fairly well, yep. uh, and obviously uh, high-potency dots are going to be one of the best things against wielders of this item, Sirkets, Yonkways. Uh, the additional 30% damage there is going to be very, very uh, painful when you're yes. dotted up. But uh, that does bring it to the end of the list of item changes in Season 2. Um, overall, it seems like, you know, similar to when we talked about map changes and god changes, that big focus for items is, is diversity of builds, allowing for more options, uh, especially through the early stages of the game, and really allowing for this idea of what you build uh, has this kind of long tail to it, and building the right item at the right time potentially changes the game for you, and, and it's just allowing a lot more of those options to play out. So thank you guys very much for your time. I uh, hope you guys all enjoyed it. H at home watching the, uh, the lovely item breakdown that does it for us here. If you want to see more about what's coming up in this patch and see our, uh, our lovely panel break that down for you, you can click on any of the annotations right here.